almost 100,000 companies that have used the scaling up tools um, successfully, I can give that and I can plug it in wherever I see suit it. But I also don't over, try to overcomplicate it with the tools and just throw all the tools at people. That's where I think the skill of coaching and the skill of assessing and understanding somebody's um, challenge and then prescribing the right tools and resources. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another show, Zavaunis. My name is Nir Zavao, your host. And each time, in each episode, I try and find interesting people from different places around the planet where I can learn something and uh, maybe make some new friends. And a couple of weeks ago, I went on a call, something with EO, the Entrepreneurs' Organization, and uh, I met Katie, which I've never met before. And we started emailing and we said, let's jump on a call. She had no clue that this is going to happen now. And uh, we're going to meet online and do a podcast together. So, Katie, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Thank Good. You How's me. the surprise? You happy? <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> I wish I had a co coffee before this, but I'm ready. Where, where are you located now? I'm in Tulum. I'm in Mexico for Tulum. the winter. Okay, so I'm, I'm in Tel Aviv, so that means uh, early morning for you now? It's 9 a.m., exactly. And you don't usually wake up at 9 a.m.? Well, I, I woke up at 6 a.m. Actually, I already had clients before this. So. Unbelievable. And, uh, every time I do an episode, apart from doing the whole surprise about you not knowing that we're going to record now, I usually surprise my guests by asking them to give a short 60-second elevator pitch about anything, who you are, where you come from, what do you do, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Are you ready? Absolutely. I'm ready. So, so I'm originally from Germany and I traveled around the world for four years from 2013 until 2017. And I built an online business while I was traveling. And after four years, I got bored of traveling, believe it or not, <laughs> I couldn't see beaches anymore. And I moved to New York City and I started a coaching business there and I did executive coaching in all different kinds of big organizations, professional coaching, professional development, personal development. And I found myself most drawn to the tech space and the startup space. So I did another coaching certification, which was much more business uh, focused. And you may have heard of the scaling up uh, tools, scaling up Bern Harnish, who is also the founder of Entrepreneurs Organization. So I'm one of their scaling up coaches as well. That's and the, the I, Gazelle coaches? Exactly. Okay. So I left New York in 2019, moved to Barcelona and was living between Barcelona and London, and then eventually moved full time to London and built my practice there again. And now I'm just in Tulum because of the lockdown, because everything is cold and dark in London, but I'm going to go back in two weeks. And yeah, about my work, I work with CEOs of scale up companies, mostly in the tech space and or tech enabled companies. The product doesn't really matter. The scale is what matters. And I help them um, through leadership development on an individual level, help them with their challenges as the CEO as they go through the scaling phase, but also on a, on a, on a business level, the strategic planning with the executive teams, execution, cash, and people and culture. So it's very, it's a 360 um, I see myself as a resource to the CEO and wherever I can provide tools, coaching, or even other experts and people with, in my network. So I'm, basically it sits on the scaling up concept of the four pieces, right? If I understand correctly. Yeah. And then extensive experience you have from other places. But yeah. you started a long time ago, a few years back, and you've worked with CEOs remote for a long time. Yeah. Uh, how did they take it uh, in 2018 and 19 working like this? Now it become, became something that's common, right? We just can't meet. Yeah. yeah. I guess because I'm in the tech space and people are very forward thinking and very just they're excited about these kinds of things. But it was definitely more of a challenge. And especially the ones that were not necessarily in tech or just different generation, they wanted me to be in the office. So, yeah. Everybody needs, 
Everybody needs a mentor, in my opinion. Do you agree with that? I agree with that, but I wouldn't necessarily call myself only a mentor. It's a mix between coaching and mentoring and advisory, and the mentoring is the smallest part of it. What makes a good coach? What makes a good coach? I would say enabling somebody else to uh, step into their potential and not, when you compare to a mentor, follow somebody else's journey necessarily. And I think um, coaching and advisory is an amazing tool for CEOs, especially because it's a peerless role. And in my experience, every time they get on a call with me, they're it just comes out right it's like there's so many things so many things i cannot necessarily talk about with my investors or with my senior team or with my family even with my employees so to have that safe space and um be able to strategize not necessarily only business challenges but in general career person challenges leadership challenges um interpersonal challenges um and create a plan for it and be smart about it rather than re reacting in the in the moment is valuable i think in a leadership position <laughs> I, I completely agree and while i was i'm listening to you and what what resonates to me or actually i'm i i'm now remembering I, um, a few years ago i would write in the newspaper about the food industry i own bars and restaurants and stuff and i would write about the food industry and, and everything to do with management and, and vendors and stuff like that. A lot of people would say, oh, if you consult, you don't do. You know that saying? Consultants mm -hmm. tell you what to do, but they don't actually do it. And it was funny because at the bottom, they also say the bars I owned at the time. Do you find it that everybody necessarily needs to be, so if you, you work with tech, do you necessarily think you need some sort of a track record, you needed to sell a company, or is that something completely different? Yeah, I think in some cases, for sure. I had somebody request coaching for me the other day who was raising a Series A, and I helped with that before, but they were looking for something very specific in terms of the pitch deck. So I referred that person to somebody else and think that they would be a better fit. So. I see myself in that sense more of a generalist. And let's say, for example, consulting, going into a company, identifying, assessing what's working, what's not working, and then providing the solution and telling them this is what I think is the right thing is a very different approach than coaching. I go into teams and I facilitate. I facilitate the process of identifying the issues. I facilitate the process of coming up with solutions. I facilitate the process of prioritizing what do we need to work on setting the OKRs, the responsibilities, the team is doing that work, right? I just facilitate and I ask the questions in order for them to organize themselves. So I don't position myself in that sense as the expert in, I know what's best for your company. I can give best practices and I can give tools that have been proven over, obviously, almost 100,000 companies that have used the scaling of tools um, successfully. I can give that and I can plug it in wherever I see suit it. But I also don't over, try to overcomplicate it with the tools and just throw all the tools at people. That's where I think the skill of coaching and the skill of assessing and understanding somebody's um, challenge and then prescribing the right tools and resources, but still in a partnership. So I don't tell them this is what we're going to do. I make suggestions. And then if the tool is great, but could be adjusted, then we use it as a foundation to work through it ourselves in a, in a adjusted way. So that's where I see the, the art of coaching, of understanding what is suited at what point, where do we need tools, where do we need a typical coaching approach, working through a challenge, just changing somebody's perspective on a certain um, problem that already is the solution itself. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a mix between executive coaching and business advisory how many how many countries have you been to um something around 30 30 countries in uh, in how many countries have you met ceos or or, or or consulted in general well 
maybe five. I mean, in Germany. Or oh, oh, nationalities of CEOs you've met along the way. Would be oh. five. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe 15 I don't know most of my clients are in, in London and in New York and obviously those cities are very international so yeah. Israeli clients I have Australian clients I have British clients I have um, German clients I have American clients I have, <laughs> the, 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 the reason why I'm asking because being a good facilitator is understanding the, the problem and then allowing everybody to lead the, the sheep to the right place, right? Until they understand, you kind of know what, the, what needs to happen, the process, yeah. you know the process, you just need to walk them through it. And yeah. how Get do you perceive the difference in cultures over the years? You know what, I don't see the difference in cultures, I see the difference in attitude. And this is something that actually over the past year or so has been very interesting for me to see when I, um, when I saw bigger, um, just more <laughs> like a higher number of entrepreneurs and CEOs, right? Because I was in accelerator programs. I was with Tech Nation. I was, I'm still one of the upscale coaches with, uh, with the Tech Nation upscale program. Then I left the CEO roundtable of, um, of the mayor of London office. They launched something in December. Yeah. So I just spoke to so many, so many CEOs, not only on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but also in groups. And the pattern I saw in terms of the people who were successful in coaching and they really took some, something away from either engagements, one-on-one -on -one engagements or, um, or roundtables is that they want to learn. They don't see themselves as the experts. They see themselves as the person who organizes the senior team and enables the senior team. And they acted as a sponge and they were so curious and so open to learning and so open to receiving help and so grateful for it. And those were the people who were the, like, they made the biggest change in the shortest time. The ones I get on the call with that feel like, oh, prove me something. What do you have to, what do you, <laughs> what do you have to offer to me? They were the ones who usually stood in their own way. So I think it's much more of an attitude and all. Um, I, I can hear your I can hear your passion when you start your your eyes light up when you start saying and I met these people and they're like this and, and the excitement and did you ever think this is this will be your profession? So I was going to become an architect after I traveled for the first year. I was going to become an architect for the sole reason that it's the only only thing in school I liked was art in the in my teenage years. So I was like, oh, I'm, I may as well do something creative, right? I don't think I would have been that good at it. And I realized really quickly that if I have a regular nine to five job, go to college to the whole, I would have been miserable. So after one year of traveling, I decided, okay, I'm not going to become an architect and I'm not going to get a nine to five. And for now, at least I'm not going to go to college. So I did my certifications, which both took me a year and a half, but I didn't pursue the regular bachelor master. Um, career road and um, my friend told me about coaching and the moment she told me about coaching I knew this is what I was going to do for life and in the beginning it was much more personal because I was traveling and exploring and I was so excited about personal development and understanding myself better and then it moved more and more and more into a professional and business. And just, I always ask myself the question, who is the person that I'm most inspired by? What do they do? And what challenges do they have? And how can I help them? And it just very, very quickly identified itself as the entrepreneurs that already have the companies and that have all the responsibilities on their shoulders. And maybe it's because that's also my personality type. I'm very type A. I usually... Uh, I'm the person that people go to with their problems and they lean on me. And so I can emphasize with that. And I, for me, it's, that's it's, my mission. By the way. That supports everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. You know, when, when you go from uh, um, dating advice to your friends, right. To actually selling your time to other yeah. people. I think that's when we understand that we like it, it's just the way of what we want to do. And yeah. you said you didn't study or you didn't go to college or university or whatever. What do you think about um, colleges and universities in 2021? And the reason why I'm asking is um, 
I had the pleasure of teaching in the college where I studied in the same class. And after seven years, I quit. And I quit, even though I love teaching, I love the students. Some of those students have, uh, have been with me for years as employees, but I feel we need to change things. It can't keep going this way. How do you feel about it? Whatever I'm about to say, you have to take it with a grain of salt because I never went to college and I all see it from an outside perspective. I don't see it as an accelerator necessarily in life for people with my personality and people that don't necessarily want to have a regular job. So in that sense, if I meet my younger me, I wouldn't recommend going to college. I think I'd made the right decision, but there is, I think it's a tool, right? And when I was 20, I reverse engineer my vision for when I, when I'm 30 and college was just not, the fastest way to get there. But if I want to become a doctor or if I want to become something else, then that is very much a natural. Uh, Which 20 year old sits and does their vision for their thirties? I don't know. I think that's why I love company strategy and all that kind of stuff, because I just take the long term and then I reverse engineer it and break it down. And I just executed it by the, um, <laughs> By the year and i just made the plan it's hilarious but now that i'm looking back oh not everybody did that okay let's let's do it like this if you're a 20 something year old male female please uh, um look at this as an idea an option of creating your vision for the next decade and seeing where you want to be and then check it out by the way as someone who didn't plan on going to college and ended up doing it yeah. I, I enjoyed it immensely. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. it did the network I use, the experiences yes, exactly. I had, exactly. some of them I don't I remember think, because of alcohol, well, but in general, I think they were pretty so, good. The reason why I didn't end up going to college is because I was already traveling for four years and everybody told me, well, if you go to college now, basically you're going to just party. I'm like, it's not that I partied for four years, but I did whatever I wanted to do all day. I traveled to 30 countries. I built an online business that allowed me to work remotely before remote work was a thing. And it helped me understand the coaching business. It helped me understand um, how to then later on build my practice because I was working for other coaches. And so I think if my long-term vision or somebody's long-term vision is something where college is a natural part of that. I think it's very much beneficial in the network. Again, I believe your net worth is your network. Networking is how I built my both businesses. It's, I mean, the key to everything in my, in my opinion. Um, but I don't think college is the only answer for it, but it has its place. And I don't know how it's, you know, how it's now evolved. I think it has its place. I think education network and so on is super important. I never want to stop learning. I always, you know, I, I think it has tremendous value, but I don't think college for me was the right thing. So, yeah, so do the long-term vision. In the end, I ended up doing it in half the time, but do the long-term vision, reverse engineer it, and then execute it, just execute it. You just built a, a, a vision board, a business plan and everything for yourself and executed that immensely or, or very successfully. And I think that's amazing as a concept. Thank you. So 10 years ago, I started my agency. Uh, I didn't have any money whatsoever. I didn't have a place to live. I would sleep on friends' couches in exchange of... Uh, taking out the trash, cleaning a little bit, taking out the dog when need be, and making a shakshuka. I don't know if you know what's a shakshuka, and if not, we'll make sure you know what it is, but it's an amazing <laughs> really concept breakfast. And I had a friend who owned a coffee shop. I would go there in the morning, I'd get free coffee. And people would ask me, what do you do? And I say, I do consulting. Oh, great, who are your clients? No one, want to be the first? Suddenly, after two or three months, someone said yes. And it's been a decade since, and I've had the pleasure of working with big companies and big uh, brands and doing a lot of the things I want. But when people ask yeah. me, I always wonder how they started. So um, what was, how did you get your first client? So you finished 
studying and then what? It was actually before, before I finished studying because I did my certification through the IPEC Institute, which is an American coaching training in, uh, school. It's one of the top two in the US and they already encourage you to start coaching before. So I was a digital nomad. I was excited about location independent work, right? I was excited about helping people from their nine to five into creating a location independent lifestyle. So I posted in Facebook groups and I was like, free coaching sessions. <laughs> Do you want to try out coaching? <laughs> That's how I got my first client and they were for free. And after I did, yes, yeah, so I did a few free sessions and then one person was like, I want to pay you for this. I'm going to give you, what was it, 60 euros. So that's like $80 or something like that, right? And I was like, oh, I still work with the guy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was my first client. But I wouldn't say that was my actual real client, right? So when I went to New York, I got clients through, I started writing for Forbes for the leadership um, column. So I got um, clients through press. How did you get there? I just, I wrote and I applied for it and they said, yes. So I started writing for magazines, for Success Magazine. I was in their printed version. I had no idea how I got into it. For Forbes, I wrote for Forbes and I was just writing, 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 writing. And I got clients like for that, right? So I got clients in Australia and in New York. Um, I also started working with coaching firms that sent me clients and it was more professional development and let's say new leaders and I was practicing everything I learned, right? Um, I never sold myself in a way where I was like, I did this and this is what I think is right and you have to do this, never. Best practices, tools, these are the options like using the coaching methodologies, right? Um, and that's what I did mostly in New York. So I had to leave New York for, for immigration reasons. I'm German, obviously. And I had to leave New York and I was devastated because I left all my clients there and all my business there. And I completely had to start from scratch. And that's what actually, when my business really started, I would say when I left New York and I was able to sustain myself before, but that's when I had to really ask myself who do I want to work with and what circle, what pool, what sandbox do I want to play in, right? And that's when I decided I'm only going to be in the tech space, only with the CEOs, nobody else in the C-suite, only the CEO, only at this stage of the company. Then I found that I couldn't help them with all their challenges because they had business challenges, they had operational challenges, they had um, leadership team challenges, and that's how I came across the scaling up. So scaling up again was aligned with my with my vision, and that's why why I did that. And so how 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 did you how did you get by when when you left and you made this? And by the way, I, I love the concept of deciding who are your clients. And and an amazing thing is our businesses start growing when we say no. Like Absolutely, usually. I totally agree. And well. Let's put it this way. I, I went to London. I, I was in Barcelona, right? I, I went to Barcelona. And I went to London because actually, um, uh, you, you may know the person as well. Um, a friend of mine said, okay, you, you, can, you can stay in London at the hotels that we have. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm coming for a weekend or for like five days. And I had a meeting with him and I also had a meeting with a coaching firm. And he ended up hiring me, actually. And the coaching firm didn't end up hiring me because they were really like large corporates, leadership development. Just I didn't want to be in the, the big corporates. So, um, yeah, so I was in London for one week and I had nothing to do because I had these two meetings and I had this week planned, right? And I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to do business? I mean, if I cannot do business in New York, I have to do in London. I went on my LinkedIn and I just emailed and sent messages to probably 50 people like hey i'm in london i know you don't know me but if you want let's grab coffee within three hours my week was packed i had 30 meetings in there just back to back to back to back i was like what is happening and i met amazing people and i just said to everybody right i was like i just met everybody i met amazing people many of them i'm still in contact with and 
I was, I, I left London and I was like, huh, I got a client here and I made amazing connections and people who are interested in potentially working with me. And I, I, uh, I partnered with another coaching firm. So I was like, I have to do this again. So the next month I went back. But before I went already there, I reached out to my LinkedIn network, this time a little bit more targeted um, investment firms and like partners at investment firms and, and CEOs. Um, and did the same thing and went back to back to back. I mean, 60 meetings in one week, bam, and back to Barcelona, picked up business. And I did that for like three, four months until I had what a good, enough, a good amount of clients. Then I also started using LinkedIn as a tool just internationally. So I got a partner at a, at a VC firm in London, uh, in New York, sorry, um, who I still work with to this day and just started using LinkedIn as a tool to network. Not as, a, not as an advertising tool, not as a posting, just connecting with interesting people, taking them on a coffee back then there. That was still a thing, believe it or not. And um, building connections. And that's how I built my business. And then eventually I just moved to London full time. This is like the third time in this conversation where you've said, oh, I just did. But most people don't do that. They don't start writing. They don't start reaching out to people. They don't. And you say it as if, oh, so I just send some messages. But it's about taking okay. action. So, yes. So let's say, for example, remember the first time I started my online business where I was able to sustain myself traveling? I was doing my coaching certification. So I was like, in order to learn how to run a coaching business, I have to be an assistant for another coach. So I went on the global coaching international ICF website and I emailed every single coach on there. I always made like 300, 300 um, people outreaches. And I was like, hey, I'm traveling. I'm doing my coaching certification. I can help with branding, marketing, this, that, assisting. Later on, I, I only started writing for them. So even my, even my freelance work for coaches evolved from $10 an hour and just doing repetitive assistant work to writing for them and pitching because I had the connections to the, to the media outlet. So I would sell an, an article for $200, right? So even there, I was able to, to, um, to niche in that sense, right? And I took the same concept when I was dropped in London. And um, yeah, back to the basics. I think business is really basic in a sense, right? So you make it so very complicated and complex with all of this online stuff and this ads and this marketing and fancy website here and fancy website there. In the end, it's quite simple. You have a service to offer and somebody needs it. You don't have to push it on them. You don't have to have the biggest sales skills or marketing skills. If they like it and you have value, then people will work with you. So, you know, it's interesting when you go to find clients, right? And then you find a CEO, a busy CEO, and he says, oh, great. So could you come by the office next week and we'll talk about it and we'll see if it's the right fit. And you say, oh, that's great, but I'm surfing in Mexico. How do people reacted two, three years ago when you said, I can't come to the office or it's not the way I do coaching? Well, two, three years ago, I was in New York. So I would be able to go but for practicality I mean what I do like is to meet my clients like I create partnerships with my clients and friendships with all of my clients and I meet them for lunch and we have personal conversations like it doesn't it's not necessarily a like a therapy approach if they come into a session and lay on my couch once a week you know that's not at all how it works it's really about creating a partnership where I am one phone call away after Thing happens where yeah. they can pick up the phone before an investor meeting, where they can, um, where they can go for lunch with me, and we can just have a personal conversation. So that's how I built my my coaching. So it sounds a very uh, Italian conciliary type of uh, work when they have someone to confide with to discuss all these things, and not necessarily something. Yeah, so when I'm thinking of, and this is something companies obviously ask themselves all the time, what is my mission? Why am I doing this? 
What's the purpose of this? And I think there is a huge difference of where my focus is. Do I support the company as it scales? And the CEO is part of that. Do I support the, the person who works in the company like a professional in their journey to whatever, get promoted, solve their problems with their manager, advance themselves in their career and advance their leadership and management skills? Or is it the CEO? And I focus not on the what. I'm not a strategy specialist. I'm not a whatever, people and culture specialist in that sense, right? I focus on the who. And the who for me is the CEO. And my support is for the CEO. If the CEO leaves the company, I leave with the CEO. I always ask myself that question. Do I support the CEO or do I support the company? If the CEO leaves the company and starts a new company, I will go with the CEO, right? I'm creating those long-term relationships. And for me, that means being of support to that person. And it's not about, oh, call me whenever you have a struggle with this, right? No, you call me whenever you have a struggle. And I keep working on adding tools and resources to my tool belt to be able to serve you better and better and better with every month that goes by, right? I'm working on expanding my network with the best people I can find in the industry. If that's investors, if that's experts, professionals, if that's law firms, if that's PR, it doesn't matter. So I can plug the person in when I think it's, uh, they, are, they are a good fit, right? So that's how I see myself. And that's where I see my purpose in my work. So the, the, the trust and the partnership and the friendship that I built with them is a big part of that. Well, it's, it's interesting because when you do, so consulting, if you don't scale the business is yourself. If you're sick, the business is closed. If uh, um, you're traveling the, and you're flying, the business is closed. And a big thing about is if you're not, how do you scale it? So after a certain amount of hours that you can sell, then you either need to charge more or you need to charge a different service type. And basically, as you said, people don't come necessarily to the couch once yeah. a week, but rather enjoy your uh, experience, your tools, your knowledge, your network, and so on. So how do you scale a business up to a certain point? Do you have a ceiling where you say, I'm, I'm done, I want to relax? So how do you see it? So at the moment, I'm like in the midst of it, right? So I'm, I'm not looking to necessarily take my time back in that sense, right? So for me, this five-year period now from, let's say, two years ago until maybe the next three years, is all about becoming very, very masterful at this and having all my tool belt filled in that sense, if you take that analogy, right? And to be able to do it in my sleep, practically, right? Um, and be a master at it. And I'm not looking to scale this coaching business. I'm not looking to hire coaches. I don't want to manage coaches. I want to be doing the work myself. And I find the fulfillment in the partnerships with the CEOs. What I will do is I, at the moment I'm with 22, 23 clients. I will want to go to about 15 clients and have bigger engagements rather than small engagements. So most of my clients are with me four to 12 hours a month. So most of them are actually eight. So a couple hours a week. And I basically help them do their job as a CEO better, right? So we work on, yes, challenges and yes, personal stuff, but it's a lot around company strategy and facilitating the, the executive team and enabling the executive team um, and so on and so forth. So it's not taking away time from their schedule. It's actually whatever their responsibilities are, I give them tools to, so they can do it more effectively and, and faster. Um, but yeah, so... There is definitely feeling to it, absolutely. And I do want to scale, but not with this business. This business for me is my is my passion. Is what I want to be doing, even if it's even if I can only do it ten hours because whatever I I start a family or whatever it is. This is something that I not once not one day in my life I questioned my decision. Um, 
And so I think I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing that and then start other businesses that are scalable. But this for me is very close to my heart. What types of businesses are interesting to you? I don't know if it would be necessarily a tech business. I work with tech businesses, but I understand the risk and I understand the value of it, right? But then it would be more maybe a VC firm. Maybe that's something I wouldn't want to run it, but that would be for me an enabler to, to entrepreneurs to scale their companies. So that may be something done in whatever, five years time um, to do that. But I would say angel investing in different kinds of projects also, um, being an independent advisor and having equity. I mean, all of those things are obviously not um, tied to my time. So it, I think it's more about projects. I, I go through life seeking interesting people that work on interesting projects. And if I support them with financial means, resources, my knowledge, my expertise, it doesn't really matter for me. It's about growing that where I see potential and supporting those people. So that's where I can um, obviously scale and may that be in a, you know, investment fund eventually, may that be um, co-founding another project where I don't have to be the, the sole operator. Now we started a, a restaurant here actually, so I'm not operating that, but let's see, let's see what happens. I'm, I'm open for interesting projects. So if you have anything. I'll tell you two things. One is I have a feeling you have somewhere in one of your drawers a list of exactly what you're going to do or, or, or the ideas. And, and secondly, uh, for, yeah. for everyone, before we started this conversation and um, Katie told me she was um, doing consulting and coaching, and I said, how can you be 23 and do consulting and coaching? Oh, so, I'm not 23. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you tell me your age after this call, I'll tell you about our new venture and maybe we'll do it together. Um, First of all, I want to say a huge thank you. I think it's been an amazing call and I'm really happy we jumped on it as a surprise. And thank I think you. this is inspiring for young people looking to kind of figure out what's the next step. Um, when are you coming to Israel? We'll do a session together. Yeah, you know, I was going to come last year, but then that didn't work, obviously, because COVID. I'm just waiting for it to open up. I'm coming back to London in two weeks and I will be based in London and Europe. So we'll be spending the summer there. And I'm probably going to, like, I mean, if the country opens up, but I think you guys are still closed, no? Yeah, so we'll do, if I come to London or you come to Tel Aviv, we'll do a live session and, and answer whatever people want and we'll do something fun together. I have a feeling it will be amazing. Awesome. Um, and you're yes. always welcome to my bars. And uh, again, I want to say oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I love the surprise on a Thursday morning <laughs> without coffee. <See? laughs> um, okay. But so yeah, right. also, after this call, I want to learn more about you. I know your audience knows a lot about you, but I want to learn <laughs> I'll, more about I'll tell you anything you want. So uh, everyone, thank you so much if you've listened so far. Hope you enjoyed another Zavanas episode. If you need anything, feel free to reach out to me anywhere you can find me. And uh, you're also welcome to the bar anytime you want. Um, thank you very much, and I'll see you all soon.